All right, cool. So finally, we get to start talking about uh, what happened with uh, Hurricane Katrina. So tonight is um, not going to go the whole time. Tonight's going to be our, our first toe in the water, just to give us some context, and then we'll pick it up after here. Um, obviously, this is why we're we're going to New Orleans is to to help with the still ongoing recovery of hurricane uh, of, uh, in the, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. Um, so we'll start talking about this tonight and continue talking about it uh, after tonight. So this, this is a classic picture um, looking uh, towards the ocean from the, from the north, looking south essentially. And this is, um, you know, looks like Beirut, city on fire, the, the big football stadium there is in the middle and you're seeing water in what would normally be, you know, dry land, uh, ro roadways and such. So to contextualize stuff before we get too far into it, a um, couple things just by way of, of reminding us or, or telling us if, if I hadn't mentioned this before, uh, New uh, the Mississippi River drains a huge proportion of the U.S., about 40% of the continental United States. So this is, if a drop of rain falls anywhere in any of, you know, the Ohio River Basin, any of, any of these different uh, color uh, regions, it eventually, by gravity, is going to either get stuck in the ground, or if it goes anywhere, it's going to end up um, going right past New Orleans and dumping out into the Gulf of Mexico. Historically, this is a fantastic resource. This is why Louisiana is so productive in terms of wetlands, in terms of uh, agriculture, um, all that wonderful stuff, um, and, and essentially all the sediment that's come down with this water is what's been deposited down here and created this, you know, one of the world's great deltas. Really, really cool stuff. In today's day and age, that's, that's good in the sense that there's water. We here in California are having less and less water, right? So they they have the upside of having a lot of water where they live. The downside is in addition to sucking up all of this uh, water and, and, and sediment, it's also pulling other things. So primarily there's a lot of agriculture these days in, this, in, in the watersheds uh, that drain into the Mississippi. And so that's gonna be bringing a lot of stuff that maybe we don't like, a lot of fertilizer, a lot of nutrients, things of that nature. And so that, in turn has caused uh, several issues in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but, but point is, drains a bunch of, of the US. Again, as we, as we talked about in our culture discussion, um, not only is this going one way, but culturally, stuff went up as well as down, right? So the, so the highways, these were the original highways and, and still remain that, <clears throat> that way for much of uh, uh, certain agricultural, uh, certain sectors in the US, so moving coal around, moving coal from the upper Ohio Valley or wherever down through, and then you know, historically bringing goods and services back up. This is uh, some topography. Now this is not California, California elevations here, right? It's much, much more subtle, but um, color-wise here, the green is basically sea level or very close to sea level. And so what you see is most of the southern region of Louisiana is, is pretty darn flat. We don't have mountains. This is pancake land, right? We don't have you know, big cliffs or, or any you know, massive geological features in the sense of, of our very young coastline here in, in the, on the west coast. Um, but but you know, even not, not knowing what, what this represents on this map, you can still see there's this lower bluish, darkish bluish region running down right here. Right, the Mississippi, right here, the Mississippi River coming down. Here it is, you know, uh, a spinning, curling, da, 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 going right here, and then going out the so-called bird's foot delta. So the notion is, people argue that this looks like a splayed foot of a bird, like an egret or something like that. The so-called bird's foot delta. Um, and and again, you can always recognize New Orleans. Here's that big saltwater lake. It's not really a lake, but we call it a lake, right? Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Pont Chart Rain. That's how I remember how to spell it. Pont Chart Rain, Pontchartrain. And then right here, boop, here's this oxbow, big boop. That's where New Orleans is. 
So knowing nothing else, you guys can always look fine, paunch train, and then go straight down, and that's where the, again, the crescent is of the so-called crescent city. Um, immediately, again, knowing not much more, just, just looking at the landmass here, we see it's very um, you know, smooth and, and homogeneous, say, up here, nice sort of smooth edges, right? We get down here, it's all kind of Swiss cheesy. It's all kind of poop, 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 bullet holes or, or erosion or, or, or sort of you know, uh, rotting clothes or something, you know, some kind of analogy like that. And that's, we're losing those wetlands. So more on that later, but that's a, that's a key feature you can see knowing nothing else about this system. So here's some general uh, breakdown of, of the state. So North Louisiana up there, Central Louisiana, um, uh, the Florida parishes, Greater New Orleans, which is essentially where we'll spend um, basically all of our time, and then the, the sort of deep south over there, uh, the red, the, the Cajun country, Cajun land. That's right. Those are the, those, those are the crazy Canadians, the, Canadi the Acadian the, that, that the British members sucked down and then took and sort of salted, salted across the Gulf Coast because they didn't want them to form a big, a big city or a big uh, military power. So yeah, that's Zydeco land, that's you know, Tabasco sauce land, that kind of stuff. Okay, um, and then I think it's also really important, this is uh, our last census, we're getting ready to have our next census, uh, which is a whole nother story. Hopefully we have a real census. There's some folks that, uh, unfortunately, even the census now, which is a required thing in our constitution, is become a political thing, which is uh, dis a disappointment. But every 10 years, we're mandated to count, to enumerate everybody in the US and then in turn from that, we figure out, you know, the congressional representatives, right, Dan? All that good stuff. And, and so uh, this is the, our, our latest census. Now, the Census Bureau updates population every, every year or so, usually in July. Um, and those are based on estimates, but, but, and they're pretty good. But we only count, officially count, once a decade. And so this is our last uh, census. And... First thing to look at is, is uh, so the darkness is, so the darker it is, the more people per, per block. Uh, and this, and these, these are per parishes. Now remember, which, what we call counties, they call parishes, same thing. It's just everywhere else in the US, it's based on English law. Everywhere in Louisiana is based on Napoleonic law or French law, right? So, there, so these, there's weirdness in many dimensions, weirdness. But um, so, here, so these are the different parishes, and this is the population within each of these various parishes. And so again, the darker is the more dense, the more abundant people, and the, the more towards the, the light beige yellow, the fewer folks. So in general, first thing that should jump out of you, we have a, a big population center over here near Texas. We have a big population center here, which is um, uh, Baton Rouge, which is the, the state capital, the political uh, center of power of the state. And then uh, that's where LSU is, Louisiana State University, super huge university. Uh, and then this is, uh, and then this is the, the greater New Orleans area right here. So New Orleans is in Orleans Parish. And so we will basically be working in, uh, or spending most of our time in Orleans Parish and Plaquemines uh, and a little teeny bit in St. Bernard. But so basically this is where we're gonna spend most of our time. Uh, again, large population there. But have a look. This large county, if you will, is on the order of, you know, it's less than half a million people in that county. So it's important to reset our, our you know, we're not, we're coming from the most populous state and we're going to an, a, a less populous state. Similarly, we're going from, even though it doesn't seem like it, when we're trying to pay for school and all that kind of stuff, we're going from a very wealthy state to a very poor state. So we have to reset some of our expectations and stuff in terms of a whole variety of things. And, and the number of people is, is, but, uh, is but one of those. And I think I've told you guys this story before, but several times we'll be doing something and, and some person we meet, some new person or whatever, we go, oh, what are you doing? And you guys will say what we're doing. And then they'll go, oh, it's cool, you should talk to this other group. We're like, really? Yeah, you should talk to this other group. Oh, cool, they're from the West Coast too. 
Oh, awesome. Who, uh, who, what, where are they? They're from some university. Ah, oh, great. Who are they? And they're talking about us. And so that's because it's such, there, there, aren't, you know, there aren't millions and millions and millions of people. And because we've been going many times, sometimes people write a story about us or people talk about us. And again, it's, there's more of a small town, especially as we get into places like Plaquemines and, and stuff. Okay, now we've zoomed in here to New Orleans. I'm going to show you a slightly different, um, different map in a second. But again, Pontchartrain is up on the upper left. There's that classic oxbow. Remember we said about the, the Mississippi River? And then, and again, recall that it's flowing on your screen. It's flowing from the left going to the right. Uh, and then this is just to say that uh, we have a bunch of different neighborhoods in New Orleans. Um, we call them neighborhoods. Uh, originally, uh, the, the first, the first um, so if you have a look, so some of these are just, there's a, they're a name, like Holy Cross or something. Others will say something like the Ninth Ward. This is, this is the Upper Ninth Ward. This is the Lower Ninth Ward. Uh, seventh Ward, we'll go to Bullets one night. That's in the Seventh Ward. So wards are original voting districts of the, of the city. And so there are, there are a bunch of, and if you remember, if you guys are listening to Kermit, that Kermit Ruffin song, he's like, we're about 17. You know, he's calling out all these different, different uh, areas of the city. Um, m most of them are more commonly known by these uh, other uh, names. The Lower Ninth Ward is, we'll spend some time there. Our house is over here. Lower Ninth Ward. Um, but that's the, that, that is the area that was the most devastated from the flooding and, and, and gets most of the attention. But there are several areas that were impacted. To answer Steve's question, here is the elevation. So this is, again, that same, same uh, image. And what we're looking at here is, uh, so the darker is the lower. Uh, sorry, the, the darker rust color is the lower. The lighter peach color is, uh, is, is higher elevation. Right, so you can see here, low, 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 you know, low, 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 low. So, so there's definite, um, uh, mostly, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll just say that. So, so even though we're talking very little, a few feet difference here, clearly it made a huge difference. Again, as I, as I said before, this was the high ground where the French Quarter is, the original establishment, the original settlement was there and from there everything came out. Oh, the other thing to say is um, we say, we, in our part of the world, we say downtown. They don't say downtown because down and up mean, it's like, what does that mean? It's so hard. So they use terms like mid city. So what we might call the downtown, uh, well, hmm, let's see, do I have a map of this? Uh, so, so here is the French Quarter. What we might call the downtown, meaning the main business district where we have the tall buildings and sort of the financial stuff and the, and the you know, power players of the city, that kind of stuff. That jazz is right next to the French Quarter in this area called the Central Business District. So they call it the Central Business District or everybody over there just called the CBD, the acronym. And they, so they don't say uptown because uptown, if they say up, they'd say up river or down, down river. So up river would be something this away, down river would be something that away. Um, so this is just an example of uh, several days after, we'll see some videos in a second, but several days after um, the area's still flooded. And without going into, I'll show you another map in a second, but suffice it to say, that's the lower, you know, essentially the, the protective shell that were the levee system that we erected popped. And so gravity was in charge in terms of where the, where the flooding was. So therefore, the lowest areas were the most impacted. Okay, this is the one I really was really trying to show. Okay, so this is, this is not neighborhood. This is, this is uh, areas. And here we go. So, this, so the, the part that's the light color is uh, city of Orleans or Orleans Parish. Again, it's just like San Francisco. The county of San Francisco is the same thing as the city of San Francisco. So uh, if, you're, if you're looking up stuff, reading stuff, note if they say New Orleans or greater New Orleans area, or if you're looking at uh, um, a census data, they'll say a greater, greater, 
what do they say? What do they say? Then greater statistical unit or greater uh, metropolitan unit, I think they say, or greater metropolitan area. And so, so when they say that, they're they're talking about areas that. And so our, the airport when we land, the airport you know is over here, and so they'll talk about that. And then this is Jefferson Parish, or what people a lot of times will just call Jeff Parish. Um, and this is this is Saint Bernard. This is where we'll this is where our house is over over here. Um, so to orient us, here we go. Here, uh, French Quarter, boom, 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 right there. Here, F, FQ. This is the Central Business District. The area right down by the water is known as the Warehouse District, but people call it Central Business District. This is this is uh, the area of the Garden District. I mentioned all that nice, those nice, really cool houses and and you know neat neat uh, vistas and things. Um, this is Uptown, the Uptown District. This is Mid City. So we'll go to a lot of, this is where Rock and Bowl is and all that kind of good stuff. Um, the Gentilly, there's a Gentilly Ridge. Uh, this is the Bywater. So this used to be a place that um, uh, was, shall we say, um, I wouldn't take you guys there. <laughs> I just say that, kind of a little sketch, shall we say. And it's rapidly gentrifying. Um, so this is sort of the, this is sort of like the most recent happening spot where you used to be able to get a lot, you know, so it's the same old story we're seeing everywhere. So it used to be where the artists hang out, folks that are poor, can't really afford something. So they're down in this perhaps sketch neighborhood and then it starts, somebody buys a place next to them and kind of fixes it up. So all the tragically, not all, but, but many of the tragically hip restaurants, you know, like Fugu, street tacos, like that kind of stuff. That's by water. Um, you know, the hip art galleries by water um, at the moment. You know, give it another couple of years and it'll move somewhere else. Um, and then this is the Industrial Canal, which we'll talk about. And then this is the Lower Ninth Ward. And then right over here is uh, Chalmette, where, where we'll stay. And then uh, this point is called Algiers. And we will take, at one point, we'll take the ferry, we'll drive across the Mississippi in our vehicle or float across the Mississippi in our vehicle. So we have right, right, where are we? Right here, we have what's known as the Mississippi River Bridge. So sometimes we'll drive across the Mississippi River Bridge. Sometimes we'll take the, uh, we'll go on a ferry and we'll go from this side to over here. This is Algiers. Um, and then over here, English Turn, this area, English Turn, that's where uh, our restorations are. So our restorations uh, spread. Some of our sites are in Orleans Parish. Some of our sites are in Plaquemines Parish, which is really advantageous for us because we have access to monies, per, you know, as urban, urban restoration, urban forestry, all that kind of stuff. And we have the, the suburban kind of stuff. So it's, 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 it's valuable from, you know, an NGO not having any money, needing to get resources from wherever we can away. It's also really valuable in that we have access to things like bike pads. And so we're in the city and so we get access to resources to help bring folks that maybe aren't used to spending a lot of time in nature and outdoors, you know, so we can have access to programs and things to help get people more exercise and get them, get them riding their bikes and coming out. So there's, there's advantages to sometimes being in the city, sometimes being in the country. And, and so we're, we're fortunate here in that, uh, that that uh, is an advantage for us. And then this area over here is just is just this is uh, New Orleans East. And I mentioned to you guys last time that I think I mentioned to you last time that Walt Disney was originally going to build Disneyland out here. Yeah. So so that place, which which then became uh, uh, Six Flags, uh, another amusement park, which was um, having tough times. And then when Hurricane Katrina happened, it devastated it, and it's just uh, it's just nuked now. Uh, that's out here in, in New Orleans East. And, um, and when Tom gives his talk on the historic, on the vegetation changes over time, um, New Orleans East is one of the places that we see massive devastation and, and massive loss of wooded vegetation, so swamp uh, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina because of salt water and flooding and, and, and various other damages. Okay, so this is what, this is, uh, an ex again, we haven't gone into, we're, we're ramping up here. This is just to give you guys context. But I'll show you this, these same slides again later on. But this is um, LIDAR data. So this is an airplane flying, shooting a laser beam down, measuring very precisely how, how much elevation is there. And this, is, this was by our, from our friends at NOAA and, and the USGS. 
And so this is a day five after the levees popped. So day five after Katrina went past. And what we're seeing here is, is the, the rainbowy colors is standing water. And uh, note that there's these hard lines here, right? That isn't, that isn't data cut out, those of you that have had our GIS classes. That's not data that's been excised. That's that the water is right up to the wall, right? So the bathtub is flooded. So outside, maybe lower, inside the water is, is, is high, right? Because we have to pump it out. And so this is when they're pumping it out. And so again, um, uh, what you see is, is the French Quarter, right? Remember, you guys all know what this is now, right? The bend. The, this sort of high ground here is dry. So it got rain and all that. Of course, the, the, the concrete, the sidewalks were wet, but it wasn't stand, by and large, it wasn't standing water. Standing water is in the lower areas. And then over time, this is day 21. We still had uh, you know, some areas that were inundated, but, but uh, you can see that only the lowest of the low, by and large, are still, um, are still wet. Um, and then again, more on this later, but just to contextualize stuff, this is uh, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, um, where we see differences in uh, population shifting. And so what we see is, we see areas uh, uh, in, generally speaking, the higher grounds, the areas that, or the areas that didn't flood, better way to say it, uh, tend to have gotten wider after, right? So tend to be more, it's folks with more access to capital, more access to money, those folks return there, not to some of the other places, et cetera. And areas that were flooded tended to stay uh, African-American. Okay, uh, continuing to take us back, because you guys probably don't remember any of this. I'm gonna show you guys, um, and I think a very, telling news conference. So here in the next session, I'm, I'm not trying to attack anybody politically, I'm just trying to lay it out. And it's important to say that there is blame to go all around. Um, uh, at all levels of government, various actors, but I'll leave it up to you to decide, um, uh, to, to interpret stuff. Uh, so again, President Bush was our president when this, this uh, event happened in 2005. And this is an excerpt from uh, his final press conference as president. Um, for some reason, when, I ripped the, when, when my colleague ripped the, the video for this, um, because I can't use, <laughs> can't use DVD players anymore because our computers are so advanced, somehow it didn't take the audio. So I'm gonna play a, a slightly visually kind of slightly weirder version from one of my old lectures, just so you guys can see it. But so what I've done is I've taken, this is the live press, and surprise, surprise, you can't find this on the George W. Bush archive. So this is my only copy. Um, in any event, so this is, this, is, this is his final press conference, and he's, he's entertaining questions about all aspects of his presidency, 9-11, the war in Iraq, all this and that. So what I've done is I've just edited this a bit, just so that it's only the parts relevant to Hurricane Katrina. Okay, so again, this is a press conference where reporters are like, Mr. President, blah, 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 and so that's what's going on. So you have to listen, to some of the reporters' comments, they're not mic'd, so some of the reporters' voices are a little bit low, so I'll turn the volume up a little bit, but let's, let's hear what he has to say. I asked uh, if you had made any mistake. Yeah. And I'm not trying to play gotcha, but I wonder, when you look back over the long arc of your presidency, uh, do you think in retrospect that you have made any mistakes? And if so, what is the single biggest mistake that you may have made? Got you. Uh, I have often said that uh, history will look back and determine that which could have been done better or um, you know, mistakes I made. It, clearly putting a mission accomplished on an aircraft carrier was a mistake. It sent the wrong message. We were trying to say something differently, but nevertheless it conveyed a different message. Obviously some of my rhetoric has been a mistake. Um, I thought long and hard about Katrina. You know, could I have done something differently? Like land Air Force One? either New Orleans or Baton Rouge. 
the problem with that, and uh, <laughs> is that um, uh, law enforcement would have been pulled away from the mission. And then your questions, I suspect, would have been, how could you possibly have flown Air Force One into Baton Rouge and police officers that were needed uh, to expedite traffic out of New Orleans were taken off the task to look after you. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, I'm hopeful the country doesn't slip into protectionist policy. April. Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, you were sound asleep back there, so I just said. No, <laughs> no I wasn't. There was a whole clear row before me. I thought you were going to go there. Either way, thanks, Mr. Price. Um, Mr. President, um, on New Orleans, you uh, basically talked about a moment ago about the photo opportunity. But let's talk about what you could have done uh, to change the situation for the city of New Orleans to be further along in reconstruction than where it is now. And also, uh, when you came or began to run for the Oval Office about nine years ago or so, uh, the James Bird Dragon Death was a residue on your campaign. And now, at this time, 2009, we have the first black president. Could you tell us what you have seen on the issues of race as you see it from the Sure, country? thanks. First of all, uh, we did get the $121 billion, more or less, dollars passed, and there being spent. Secondly, the school system is improving dramatically. Thirdly, people are beginning to move back into homes. This storm was a devastating storm, April, that required a lot of energy, a lot of focus, and a lot of resources to get New Orleans up and running. And uh, has the reconstruction been perfect? No. Have things happened fairly quickly? Absolutely. And is there more to be done? Than that and, uh, well, more people need to get in their houses. More people need to, you know, have their own home there. Oh, but, but the, the systems are in place to continue the reconstruction of New Orleans. Um, you know, people said the federal response was slow. Don't tell me the federal response was slow when there was 30,000 people pulled off roofs right after the storm passed. You know, I, I, I remember going to see those... Uh, Helicopter drivers, <laughs> helicopter drivers, drivers to thank them for their courageous efforts to rescue people off roofs. 30,000 people were pulled off roofs right after the storm moved through. It's a pretty quick response. Could things have been done better? Absolutely. Absolutely. But when I hear people say the federal response was slow, then what are they going to say to those chopper drivers or the 30,000 that got pulled off the roofs? Uh, yeah, I would say. It, it, well, you could say, what about the thousand people that died, um, or why did it take so long to remove the people from the roofs? Um, and I don't think anyone is faulting the Coast Guard for doing a yeoman's task of of doing stuff. But um, this is 2009, right? So this is, you know, three odd years after Katrina hit. And the question the reporter asked was, could you have done more? And his answer was, takes a while. Yeah. It's hard to convey the difficulty in explaining this to you. 9-11 happened. 9-11 happened. 9-11 happened and a whole bunch of crazy stuff went down. Understandably, our country was, uh, uh, if you guys weren't really aware of it then, it was crazy. I mean, it really, really was crazy. People didn't know if, if something else was gonna go on. People were freaked out. President Bush's administration said, we got you. Their deal with you in changing the federal government, re, the largest reorganization in the United States of America since World War II, the, the deal they made with the American public is, we'll do stuff, pass some things to give us 
uh, improved ability to look into your bank accounts, to listen to your conversations, all that kind of stuff. But it's okay because we're going to make you safe. If some crazy folks that are disturbed and all that do something horrible, we got your back. The major city in the United States flooded. And I would suggest to you that nobody had our back. And that's a huge thing. So this is not a political statement. This is an, an objective observation. Saying that we pulled your whole evidence that you had an effective response to a, one of the largest natural disasters in the history of our country, that we had some Coast Guard uh, pilots, their names are pilots, not drivers, pilots did you know crazy fantastic job and, and got as many people as they could to, to safety that's fantastic as we'll see there were tens of thousands of people stranded in a major American city and the response of your government that was supposed to that's supposed to save you and I when the earthquake comes here to Southern California or when Al Qaeda does some insane stuff in New York they couldn't respond to this well-known, well-predicted, absolutely forecasted event. And so that is the situation that we were left with. This is what New Orleans looked like in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. Again, it's very hard to convey to you guys that every day on the news were Americans dying from lack of water, from lack of medicine, um, in a major American city. This isn't some you know, middle of Antarctica somewhere where it's hard to get to. This is in the middle of the United States of America. This classic picture here on the right where you see these folks, they're standing on the roof and they're saying, help, the water is rising. How, you know, what the heck's going on, right? So they're riding that to the Coast Guard who are in helicopters, right? We need help. The only thing that, I can, that, that rem, it reminds me of with all these folks in, in desperate circles is this. This is one of my favorite uh, paintings. This is in the Louvre. Is it, has anybody seen this painting before? This is by this uh, artist called Jericho, and it's called the, the Raft of the Medusa. And so this is my uh, lens through which I see Hurricane Katrina, or at least the, the initial days. So I'll tell you the story. Does anybody know the story of this painting? So I'll tell you the story. I think there's, there's massive parallels to what happened in New Orleans. Okay, so this is, now this is, you know, 1800s. So this is back in the day. We don't have fantastic communication. It takes a while for information to, to, to uh, move to places. So tell me if you think anything might be relevant in this story. Okay, so here's the deal. This is, we're talking about France. France, big major power. France is, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. One of the things major powers do is trade, right? So send off some goods, bring back other goods, all that kind of stuff. So one of the things, or one of, one of the, the routes of commerce was to go from France, Europe, across the Mediterranean to North Africa and trade for you know, all kinds of stuff, silks and, and, and whatever. And our, a French armada goes over to the coast of North Africa to trade. Now, uh, you might think that the, there's a bunch of you know, able-bodied seamen on the ships, you know, crewing the ship, and then they're helmed by captains and admirals that are you know, fantastic, uh, knowledgeable folks of the sea. No. The head guys, the admirals, are political appointees. So they're folks that have friends with the king and, 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 and whoever in power and all that kind of stuff, yeah? So they sail over to North Africa. They, they go into port and they, they do their trading and they get their, their armada, their ships, full of goods to bring back to France. So they're getting ready to go, getting ready to leave. And some of the able-bodied seat, you know, so some, of the, some of the regular folks on the ship are like, hey, you know, Maybe it's not safe to cross. It looks a little sketch. The head dudes, the admirals, the heads of the fleet say, you idiot, you don't know what you're talking about. We're going to get back and make some mad cash, right? They will make some mad cash, not so much the able-bodied seamen, but yeah, they'll make some cash. So they start heading across the Mediterranean, 
and this big huge storm comes up and it kills everybody. It destroys the fleet. So back in France, what's the story? The story is, oh, it's so sad. You know, act of God. We had no idea. Too bad. The risks of living in the 1800s. Too bad. That's the story that gets propagated around. The poor heroes of the, of the Armada. What actually, so that, and that happened, but what happens, one of the ships, which is known as the Medusa, hence, hence the title of the painting, one of the, one of the ships, the Medusa, uh, it, it, you know, does, no, the whole ship isn't destroyed, it's, it's broken up and it, whatever. So some of the survivors gather and they, and they uh, you know, form a little ragtag floating thing. And, and so uh, this guy, who's, who's a, an African American, a black dude, right? Lowly in the society, right? Not a lot of status. He goes out and he helps pull a bunch of these folks onto this, uh, you know, fellow human beings onto this raft. And, and, and they eventually get rescued. A lot of them die, but, but you know, some of them make it. They eventually get to the south coast of France and they're, you know, they're totally exhausted and dehydrated and all the horrible stuff you can imagine when you're lost at sea for a while. So they slowly recover and then they start to tell their story. So the Art of Jericho hears this and so he decides what he's going to do is make this counter narrative in your face. So this is the Twitter of the day. So he paints his painting. This is not a small painting. This is like a, I forget, I should know, but it's like a 12 foot wide painting, 10 foot wide painting, right? It's a beautiful oil paint. So just, just in and of itself, it's awesome. And we could spend the whole, we spend an hour talking about this, the symbology, the darkness, the lightness, the, the, the arm rays, which is, which is um, you know, emulating uh, Liberté, the symbol of France, and those, all, all this fantastic sim symbology. And this is an awesome painting in its own right. But in the context of today, what Jericho did is he starts to exhibit the painting. He puts it on display, what we would call put it in a salon, right, where all the powerful people come and drink wine and smell bad and they look at stuff and they go, oh, 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 right? And so he migrates the painting through France, eventually exhibiting it at the Louvre in the middle of Paris. So the middle of power and, and, and cosmopolitan and what it is is a massive middle finger to the authorities. And what this is saying is your story was not correct. The narrative that you pushed, <laughs> that we rebuilt quickly or something, mm, not really right. Because you said everybody died and you said it was an accident. And these folks said, no, no, no. We, we thought we shouldn't leave port and you know, idiot guy over there said we should go anyway. So that is what I think of when I think of all these folks in New Orleans that are sticking their hands up and asking for someone to please help get me out of my house or out off my roof or whatever. That's the counter narrative to the story that we did everything we could and that we had a fast response and that the government had your back. Okay, next, here's another video. This one, uh, I wanna remind you, is day 10 day 10 after the storm hit in the United States of America. This is a bit, bit of a long story, but um, I think this is, this is a, a fantastic illustration of the, of the situation. Still finding and removing the living from New Orleans. We begin with this report from Jeffrey Kay of KCET Los Angeles. We may not be back. In this area, and they're talking 60 to 80 days before the water goes down. I understand. See, so, I, I strongly urge you to get out now. Coaxing residents to abandon their homes is not in the job description of Louisiana State Wildlife and Fisheries agents. I understand your loyalty to your animals, but you're going to run out of food and water, and, and you need to take care of yourself right now. Normally, this time of the year, game wardens would be out in the countryside for the opening of the dove hunting season. But with some 60% of the city of New Orleans waterlogged, their department has dispersed a flotilla of flat bottom boats for search and rescue missions. A lot of locals are used to flooding, 
and they still think this thing's going to go down in a couple days. So we're having a hard time getting in their head. This could still be a few weeks before we get, even with them pumping out right now, getting all the water out. Even if it's a real right. elderly, serious medical issue, then we may force them to leave. Yeah. So if you could tell our airboat operator, he's number one, you're number two, and when we get to 27, we're going to start sending them out to the east. Teams from Louisiana and around the south have used hundreds of boats. Armed personnel, including sheriff's deputies from as far away as Albuquerque, provided escorts. Officials say the heavy weaponry and bulletproof vests were necessary protection. They worried about a repeat of earlier incidents in which snipers had fired at police and aid workers. As a law enforcement, I know with a dream I'd have to wear body armor to come rescue people, unfortunately. But, you know, I think the last few days they've gotten it under control. We really haven't had any incidents. And, uh, but you're wearing it. It's I'm wearing it because concern. you don't know. I mean, there's a lot of people that's been in here for a week, and I'm sure there might be a sense of cabin fever, and they're, they're just, they don't know who to trust maybe at this point. This operation yesterday was in southwest New Orleans, close to the Garden District. Throughout the city, the waters are gradually receding but they're contaminated by toxics and waste. And the flooded neighborhoods lack basic services, including communication. Many stranded residents haven't heard about the extent of the damage, and thousands have insisted on staying put. Then I saw the water, and then I was like, well, you know, it's going to rise up a little bit, but I didn't expect it to go this bad, so by the time it got to this point, I was like, well, I might as well just stay. Why? Uh, it really ain't no bother to me. Do you have any power? No, sir. You're running water? No, sir. Sewage? No, sir. Because I'll I make do somehow, some way. Independent of state agents, National Guard troops conducted their own search and rescue operations in heavy trucks. The U.S. Coast Guard patrolled from the air and private boat owners came to offer aid. Shannon Gamewell brought his boat to New Orleans from Arkansas to be a nautical good Samaritan. I just talked to my wife and I said, look, if you were here and Hallie was here, I would want somebody like me coming to get you. You know, and, and that's not, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm just a redneck with a mud buddy, you know, but in this type of situation, that helps. We got transportation till we leave. We just here till that water go down. Then we gonna go on out. Gamewell came across Shirley Johnson and her family and loaned her his cell phone so she could call her daughter in Atlanta. Tiffany, this is Shirley. Yay! We still at home. We waiting for the water to go down. I'm so glad to hear from y'all because we've been thinking and worried. Yeah, I know. <laughs> It's okay, Shirley. It's all right. It's okay. So we gonna be there. Later, as seen in video shot by a NewsHour producer, Gamewell encountered Warren Mahoney, a stroke patient. Since I had the stroke, I, you know, I need my medication and stuff like that. Out of medicine. Yeah, I got enough medicine to last two couple of days, but I need that blood pressure medicine. Now, you stand right there, okay? Put your cane down and, and I mean, use, it, use your cane. Lean on your cane, because I'm coming. I've got to come up, okay? Gamewell helped Mahoney to his boat. Flagged down a passing Air Force helicopter. And helped carry the disabled man to the chopper so he could be evacuated. Anybody home? Game wardens, hoping to find more residents like Mahoney, yelled through open doors and windows. The welfare of pets was a main reason many people chose not to evacuate. Carolyn Mitchell was worried about the fate of the animals in the house she shared with three other people. How long do you figure you can stay here? Uh, another couple of days. So, that, I mean, we are, we've been trying to get out and make plans, so... We just we really want to make sure that our animals will be taken care of until we go. So. Thank you all. I appreciate this. No problem. Eventually, game wardens persuaded the residents to put their own safety before that of their animals. 
they quickly packed belongings and were evacuated. In the next few days, officials may use more than persuasion. The New Orleans mayor has ordered all residents to leave the city. Margaret Warner has more on this story. She spoke with New Orleans police captain Marlon DeFillo a short time ago. He's the commander of the Public Affairs Department. Captain DeFillo, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Give us the latest on the evacuations. How many people were you able to evacuate today? Uh, a couple of hundred, nearly 1,000 individuals we've evacuated, we've evacuated today. Um, we still have a lot more people who are willing to be evacuated. And that's where we stand right now. Do you have a good sense of how many people there are and say where they are? So if you want to go in and get them, you can? Many of the areas that we're, we're focusing on now are public housing developments, where we have a number of people who remain in their homes on the second and third floors. Uh, their first floor is underwater. But we are working to, mainly at this point, to relieve the city of those folks who are willing to leave the city who have been stranded for the last eight or nine days without food and water, those are the people that we're concentrating on now. And are you still, are you all delivering food and water to anyone who is stranded, whether, whether voluntarily or whether they're refusing to leave? Yes, we are. But the, that can only go for so long. You know, we don't know if this is going to last a week, two weeks, a month, six months. So there is a mandatory evacuation because it is unsafe, it is unhealthy to be in the city at this time. We have not uh, completed the recovery process. We are still recovering, rescuing people. There is no running water. There is no electricity. So it's, it is a hazardous situation at this time. So when do you think you may have to resort to forceful measures? Let me just say that the New Orleanians are smart. And once we begin to tell them that there are no other options, that, that uh, it is apparent that you have to leave your home, and many folks will, will heed to that warning. Many folks, once you take those options away, they will comply and, uh, and, and leave. So in other words, you're saying that the mayor's new order last night, when you're able to tell folks that, that that's having an effect, that some people who had refused to leave now are ready to. There are some people who, once they learn what the new message was, are leaving. Now, there are some people who want to stay to protect their property, to protect their animals, we understand that, and they're good people. These are good, law-abiding citizens. What we have to do as a, as a law enforcement entity is to convey to them the importance of leaving, the importance of their personal safety, and to let them know that there are no other options. And we believe that once we go back into those communities and express those concerns, then they will do that. Now, the chief of the Pentagon's joint... So that gives you a sense for what was going on. Again, that was day 10. Yeah, Chase. So that was, that was not true. So there supposedly were reports that uh, people were shooting at officers. Um, There's no credible evidence that that uh, happened. Um, clearly, I'm sure somebody shot a gun at some point, but uh, that is really the chaos in the wake of just this, you know, insane thing. And rumors are spread wildly. So all kinds of rumors are running free. And again, because power is out in the city, cell phone service is out in the city initially and all that kind of stuff, just all kinds of crazy talk went around. And so the cops were like, somebody shot, somebody shot at, somebody, whoa, 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 whoa. Again, these guys are running on not much sleep, right? super incredibly, insanely stressful conditions. Feeling, um, at this point, there's, there's, there's federal help coming in, but in the first few days, not much, not much in the way of federal help. So feeling isolated and all that stuff, and you hear somebody was getting shot at. Uh, and, 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 and then you tell someone, and, somebody, and all of a sudden, it's, you know, it's like, it's all of a sudden, we gotta wear vests, gotta wear, you know, whoa, 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 whoa. And if you heard that one, um, wildlife officer, she said, you know, he's like, hey, have you seen anybody? She's like, no, I haven't seen anybody, but I don't want to take a chance, right? So that's, that's how those, those rumors go. Um, the chief of police, unfortunately, was, uh, was, uh, bore some of the brunt of some of that, uh, uh, 
issue where he repeated some things that turned out to not be true, and so folks blamed him for spreading some of the hysteria and stuff. But, but the reality is just it's always a chaotic situation. It's always a chaotic situation, these disaster zones. Um, I would say a lot of the stuff we just saw there, you saw the exact same thing in Houston, the exact same thing in Puerto Rico, the exact same thing in Montecito, right? In terms of, in terms of well, I don't know if I should leave or not. And then, oh, I, I want to go, but I can't leave my dog. And uh, I think I'll be okay, right? This is not stupid idiot New Orleans people. This is human nature, right? And I think when, when this happened, we had not seen a major natural disaster like this for some time in the US, at least at the scale. And so for a lot of people, it was those <laughs> stupid people. Why didn't you leave, right? Why did you build your city underwater? Didn't build the city underwater, wasn't, wasn't below sea level when they first established the city. We've been pumping out oil, and we'll talk about in a bit, oil and gas and that's helped lower the elevation of the city. Um, uh, many of these folks did not have the financial wherewithal to have a car to get out of the city, for example. And, and you know, on and on, we'll, so we'll talk about, you know, during the trip, talk about all these different things, but, but a lot of the narrative that spun up about this, those silly people, why did they do that? were uh, ill-informed, shall we say. Okay, so, boom. All this craziness is happening. These are a couple of the uh, headlines from some of the national newspapers. Just insane stuff, right? So the question is, why? So the reason we're going to New Orleans is not only to help our friends there and learn about this cool place, important part of our country, but also to ask why. And again, as we talked in the past, each of you guys are gonna have your own slant on that. Why the political situation? Why the ecological thing? You know, all this kind of why, why, why? But the key question is why? So let, let's get into some of the context next. So another, another uh, illusion I like to put in your head as we're starting to talk about this is the story of the fall of Troy. Does anybody know the story, the story of how Troy fell? Somebody tell us. It's a lie that the, the, the Greeks had to go and date Troy. <coughs> like, they totally got to the <laughs> so they okay. the room. Okay. They passed the walls of Troy, and they're like, okay, we're going to peace out and leave. And then they left this Trojan horse, but it had like a bunch of geese in it. Then they tore down the wall, and they fucking just... <laughs> <and> they <laughs> Sure, that, that's close, that's close. Uh, does anybody know the story of Cassandra? So she was, she was uh, someone that was blessed with the ability to see the future. And so, so that's an awesome gift, but she was also cursed with no one going to believe her when they hear her say stuff. So she's actually gonna tell the truth and nobody's gonna believe her. So. Many, I would say many of us in ESRM and our professions, I think at times feel like this. Oh my God, this is gonna happen. We gotta do this. And people are like, yeah, whatever, dude. <laughs> like, no, 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 this might happen. Yeah, whatever, right? And so nobody listened to her and, and she, the people said she was crazy. And, and turns out she, she predicted that, you know, that Troy would fall. And so, you know, uh, I think many of us can sense that at times when we talk about stuff. Um, here's some examples of, uh, there's the many others we can add to this now, but, but just a couple examples. This is a classic uh, book from the 80s called The March of Folly. And it was basically talking about, and, and so that's the first story in there, that the, the fall of Troy. And things that, in retrospect, you know, had a major impact on the world, uh, and, and that one simple decision was maybe um, a foolish one and, and changed the course of history. So example of is letting the wooden horse into Troy, for example, the way Matt was just saying. Um, you could talk about Martin Luther and the schism of the Catholic Church and the, and the fracturing of Christendom. You could talk about the British loss of North America. You could talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, somebody, people clearly never watched The Princess Bride and, and uh, engaged in a land war in Southeast Asia, right? <laughs> 
Um, and I would suggest. Oh, blunder. That's right. Exactly. Inconceivable. In, 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 inconceivable. Uh, and then 2005, I would argue to this list. So that, that the four is just what the book is about. But there's many others, and we could add onto this the management of the coast. We could add maybe the management of our coasts in general. But in particular, in the context of New Orleans, the management of the, the, the um, Gulf of Mexico coastline. And then, uh, this is a topic for another day, but um, what we've been doing with the Deepwater Horizon and stuff also will play into this. I started us off tonight showing you guys some examples of you know, Louisiana and this and that, and, and I was using, uh, by and large, political maps. And that's typically, I think, how we think of it. When you think of Louisiana, we think of the political boundaries, yeah? So um, the problem is that's a static thing, right? That's a, that, that's a, there's Texas, and there's Mississippi, and this and that. Um, important to realize that this is a dynamic part of our coast. Uh, the coastline has changed over the, so our existing coastline is the light dot there. The coastline has, has grown and shrunk and changed over um, you know, a long time, but most recently over the last many thousands of years. It's gone up, it's gone down. We have many coastal plains. There's all kinds of many, uh, you know, many different depositional layers there. But you and I don't see that typically. We don't see the geological history. We don't see the flooding history. We don't see the ecological history. We see this. And while very useful and very, you know, obviously this is relevant, this is not irrelevant, but in the context of understanding coastal disasters and coastal management, I would suggest that this can be dangerously misleading. So before Katrina hit, this is the last hurricane to essentially hit New Orleans. This is Hurricane Betsy. This hits in 19... 65, and just to be clear, show a couple of these things. Um, what you see here is the storm track. So this is the middle of the eye of the hurricane. And the, the hotness of the color indicates the strongest winds. So hurricane, super strong over the hot water. This guy was going north. He was heading up the eastern seaboard, stopped, er, spun around, you know, went around the tip of Florida as so many of these storms do. And then whoop, right up, uh, uh, past New Orleans, and then you see it gets a, it gets a lighter color. The strength is robbed from the storm as it leaves the warm tropical ocean. And then it becomes just essentially a rainstorm and then goes up to you know, DC and the Eastern Seaboard and stuff. So this is what many people were saying. Again, this is not a New Orleans phenomenon. This is a human phenomenon. Well, we had the Thomas fire. So I didn't think that the flooding was going to be that bad. It's the same exact thing. So here, check out, 1965. This was before, I know it's surprising, it's before I was born. And so many people, you know, people my age, grew up in New Orleans never having seen a direct hit of a hurricane. So their, their personal experience, oh, we get these warnings and it always you know, goes right, goes left, doesn't hit us. So you know, right? So that absolutely has a, plays a role in people's personal assessment of risk. What I would suggest to you is this, as so many, as is so often the case now, and this is one of maybe our first lessons that applies directly to California. A lot of stuff we're gonna learn absolutely applies to right here on campus, right here where we live. And one of them, is that we can no longer use the past as a guide. In this changing world, climate change, sea level rise, altered storm frequency, all this and that, just because, we're you, because we had this experience of how stuff happened 20 years ago, that's not a guarantee that that's how stuff's gonna play out now. And so this, is, so this led to perhaps an incorrect frame of reference. So this is what people, you heard this a lot, well, I don't, I don't remember any hurricane come through here. Wrong frame of reference. This is the right frame of reference. This is every tropical storm, which is the same thing as a hurricane, just not quite as strong, up until Hurricane Katrina hits in 2005. These are all the storm tracks. So uh, simply saying, well, that hurricane hasn't hit me, that's a fool's bargain, right? 
this whole area of our country is massively inundated with these types of systems. Some are obviously stronger than others, but to think that, to, to just sort of roll the dice and assume that you're gonna be safe because you haven't hit, one hasn't hit lately, that's a fool's errand. Just as much as it's a fool's errand to assume that we're not gonna have a big earthquake here, or that we won't have a major fire like we did this past, this past Christmas, right? These are realities. This is Cassandra talking to us, saying we should get ready for this, we should do something different, and there's that siren call of, oh, she's a crazy lady, what are you talking about, right? People in Montecito don't think that's crazy now. People on Foothill Boulevard in, in, in Ventura don't think that's so crazy now, right? So our goal as adults and your goal as educated people is when you, especially now, but, but as, you, as, you, as you leave and go into your life, when people say stuff, it's your responsibility to call them on it when they say baloney things. Respectfully, you don't want to cause a fight, you know, necessarily, right? <laughs> but you're the educated one. It's your responsibility to politely say, you know, I can see how you say that. Actually, we do need to worry about this. Actually, we do need to, to change how we're doing X. We do need to think about Y. And this is, this is but one, one case. All right. 